Psalms. Uh, John Herrick kicked us off last week with an introduction. And so we're going to launch right in to uh, the first Psalm today. So my family and I spent seven years in Turkey as missionaries uh, serving at a church in the city of Antioch. One of the many things I loved about Turkey was the shopping was so simple. The shopping was so simple. Uh Uh-oh, what happened? I think it's this HDMI cable, Michael. I don't know if we have another one we could swap out. Anyway, the shopping was so simple. Every uh, neighborhood had a corner uh, market or a bakal like this. And so you would just go, you would go about every day to to the little grocery store and you'd just get whatever you needed for that day and maybe the next and you'd just carry home whatever, whatever you needed. It was so simple. A lot of these stores were like half the size, the entire store was like half the size of this room very small, but there was one on every corner. However, it did mean, because it was so small, that there weren't a lot of options uh, to, to, to what you could buy. There wasn't a lot of variety. Um, so coming back to the States for a visit, or when we moved back here, when we moved back here, going to a store like Walmart was overwhelming. I mean, it was huge, and you had all kinds of options just in the chip aisle alone. It was like, you know, like a hundred feet of different options for just chips. Generally speaking, our, our culture really likes and values having a lot of options. And in a lot of ways, that's great. I love all the different kind of chips options uh, that we have. But you know, in life, some things are really quite simple. In life, sometimes there are only two options. Psalm uh, 1 speaks to this. There are two ways that we're presented with in this psalm. From a broad perspective in life, there are only two ways. The way of the righteous and the way of the wicked. So this psalm contrasts those two ways. The goal of the psalmist is to show that the way of the righteous is infinitely better. Infinitely better. So that the hearer might choose the right way. So as as we hear the word of the Lord this morning from Psalm 1, may God's Spirit use it to instruct us as we walk in this life. Let's go ahead and read Psalm 1 and then commit our time to the Lord in prayer. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers. But his delight is in the law of the Lord. And on his law he meditates day and night. He is like a tree planted by streams of water that yields its fruit in its season, and its leaf does not wither. In all that he does, he prospers. The wicked are not so, but are like chaff that the wind drives away. Therefore, the wicked will not stand in the judgment nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous, for the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. Father, we thank you for your word, and we ask that by your spirit you would teach us this morning, teach us that we may walk Teach us that we may walk in the way of righteousness. For your glory, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. The way of the righteous, verses 1 through 3. The psalm starts out with blessed. Blessed is the man. Now when you read man, don't think of male. It's blessed is the person. You see, often in Hebrew and in Greek, when we read the New Testament in Greek, Uh, A lot of times you'll see the word brothers written there, and it doesn't mean just male people that believe in Jesus. It's a term that's used for everyone who is a believer in Jesus. In fact, in Turkey, we we had the same thing. You know, if I were to stand up and say, uh, United in Kardeşler, 
I would be saying good morning brothers, but it's a term that means good morning everyone. And this is one of those, those phrases. So when you see blessed is the man, don't think just males. Blessed is the person. What, it, what, what does it mean to be blessed? This word means to be supremely happy and fulfilled. Supremely happy and fulfilled. And you know what? Isn't that what everyone wants? If, isn't that what everyone is seeking after? To be supremely happy and fulfilled? And you know, there are a lot of different ideas of how to make that happen. So many ideas of how, how to be blessed, how to be supremely happy and fulfilled. This psalm, though, this teaches us how to be blessed. It's a wisdom psalm. It's a psalm meant to instruct us. Teach us, teach, teaches us that being blessed is to walk the way of the righteous. And it really serves as an introduction, does this psalm, to the whole book, the whole collection of psalms, is that the, the collection of psalms is meant to be a source of blessing to us. And may, may the Lord work that out in our lives as a church as we um, continue our meditation on the psalms. What the blessed person doesn't do, it starts off with, in verse 1. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers. So verse 1 employs parallelism. Now you remember if you were here last week, Brother John uh, gave us a good uh, idea of what parallelism is and how it's used in the Psalms. It's a key feature in uh, the poetry that we see in the book of Psalms. And it's um, an idea repeated using different terms. It's an idea repeated using different terms. It's rhyming meaning rather than sound words. So what's the idea of this verse 1? The idea is that the blessed or the righteous person stays far away from the way of the unrighteous. What are the terms used to repeat the idea? They walk not in the counsel of the wicked. They stand not in the way of sinners. They sit not in the seat of scoffers. Let's think just a little bit about what it means, the wicked here. Right? When I say wicked, or when I hear the wicked, I immediately think of someone who is really, 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 really bad. You know, maybe like a murderer or something. But this word in scripture can also be translated simply ungodly. The ungodly. Someone who's not walking the way of righteousness. And you know, the Bible makes it very clear that that's how we all start out. That's everyone. That's not just murderers. That's how we all start out. Because of sin inherited from Adam. Romans chapter 3 verses 10 through 19 or so. Uh, Paul is writing to the Romans um, to show them that, hey, no matter if you're a, a Gentile or a Jew, from one standpoint, this standpoint, it doesn't matter. We're all unrighteous before God. In fact, uh, some of these the, he, he's quoting the Old Testament to make this point to the Roman believers. And some of uh, the verses that he is pulling from in these quotations are actually Psalms. So verses 10 and then 16 through 18 say this of Romans chapter 3. As it is written, none is righteous, no, not one. In their paths are ruin and misery, and the way of peace they have not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. In their paths is not blessedness, it's ruin and misery. And that's how we all start out. There is no one righteous. So 
Don't just think murderers or really, 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 really bad people. It's people who live without God, ungodly. What is their counsel? The blessed or righteous person doesn't walk in their counsel. What is their counsel? I don't know specifically what it is, but given the context, it's probably how to be blessed. How do you, how, how do you be blessed? How do you become blessed? supremely happy and fulfilled. And you know their counsel, right, is not go out and murder people and you'll be supremely happy and fulfilled. It may not seem like terrible counsel that they would give, but it's going to be without God. It's going to be how to, how to be supremely happy and fulfilled, but leaving God out of the picture. Verse 2 says, what the blessed or righteous person does. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. You might think, okay, so if the blessed righteous person doesn't walk in the counsel of the wicked, it means what are they going to do? They're going to walk in the counsel of good people, of righteous people. But it didn't say that. It didn't say that, and that shows us something very important, I think, because it's not about good and bad people. We already saw, we're all unrighteous before God. So we need something outside of our fallen human experience. We need something outside of us to change our path. And the psalmist identifies what this is. It is God's word. He delights in the law of the Lord, in God's word. Don't don't just think about law of the Lord as Ten Commandments or uh, the Pentateuch. It's instruction from God. God's word. On his law, he meditates day and night. John brought out the meaning of of the word meditate last week. That most people throughout history didn't have access to pen and notebook and Google. And thus, they did their study by mumbling to themselves over the passage they were thinking about. So to meditate has this idea of murmuring or mumbling. They would be thinking about God's word. How blessed is the man who Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel. They would be repeating it to themselves, muttering it to themselves. And that's the idea of meditation, of meditating on God's word. Again, in this verse, we see parallelism, right? What's the idea? The idea is the place of God's word in the blessed person's life. And the terms that are used is, it's his delight. He meditates on it constantly. So this answers the question, how to be blessed, how to walk the way of righteousness. It's by letting God's word reign in your life and govern it. That's how to be blessed. You want to have a blessed life? You want to be supremely happy and fulfilled? Let God's word rule in your life. This is the way. All right, there's a few of you who got that reference. That's great. Practical example of, of, how, of how that might happen, right? So picture yourself, you're driving in, in, in heavy traffic, right? Really bad traffic. All right, sorry, sorry, it's a stressful situation. Bam, and someone cuts you off. Mm, right? Chances are you're going to mutter something. <laughs> Question is, is, is it going to be... Godly or ungodly? Is it going to be righteous or unrighteous? <laughs> I'm sure we've all muttered unrighteous things when that's happened to us. But, but what about if we're meditating on God's word? For example, let's say we're, we're meditating, murmuring as we're driving in that stressful traffic. 1 Corinthians 13, 4 through 5. 
Love is patient. Love is kind. Love does not envy or boast. It is not arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. If I'm muttering that, if I'm meditating on God's word as I'm in that stressful situation, when that guy cuts me off, I'll have a much better chance at having a a godly response to that situation. If I'm letting God's word govern my life. In verse 3, we see the psalmist employ a simile. What is the blessed man, the blessed person like? Well, he's like a tree planted by streams of water that yields its fruit in its season and its leaf does not wither. He's like a tree planted by, by streams of water. Now, the word streams here is canals actually. Canals, giving the idea of irrigation. Not a wild stream that can be flooded in one season and then dry up in another season. It's irrigation. So it's like the blessed man is like a tree planted by streams of water. In the simile, the tree represents the blessed person. The water represents God's word. It's what gives life to the tree. It's what nourishes the tree. It's what makes the difference. Not the tree itself. It's the tree that is um, planted by streams of water. So it's like this, right? Uh, If you've ever flown into Boise... Uh, you'll see uh, things like this all all over the place because we live in a very dry desert, high desert climate, right? Not things don't naturally grow in many places around here, but then you'll fly over things like these um, irrigated circles of crops that are just green in the middle of the desert. Why is that? Not because the land there is any better than the, the surrounding land, or that the seed was any better, it's because there's water there. And that's what makes the difference. Guys, we're all, we're all unrighteous before God. None of us are any better than anyone else. This is what makes the difference. If we live our lives governed by God's word, The result of being planted by the water yields its fruit in its season. It's going to be fruitful. The blessed person will be fruitful. The idea of fruitfulness in the Bible almost always has a meaning of will bless others. A blessed person will bless others. Leaf won't wither. It's going to be enduring. And it will be prosperous. Prosperous in everything. I think it's important to to note here from a godly perspective, not necessarily a material one. So then the psalmist goes right into a contrast, uh, a contrasting simile for, for the way of the wicked or ungodly. What is he like? Verse four, the wicked are not so, but are like chaff that the wind drives away. Chaff is the the waste off of a head of wheat. Now, this would immediately bring to um, the original reader's mind a threshing floor, which this is a kind of a recreated threshing floor that that they might have been thinking about. The idea of the threshing floor was it was a place where the the wheat or grain was taken uh, to to beat and separate the, the chaff, the waste, from the good part, the grain. So they would grind it in some way to get that separate it out, and then they would take um, a pitchfork and toss it up into the air, and then the wind would blow away the chaff because it was light, and the, the grain would fall to the fleshing, uh, threshing floor and, uh, and be collected. So the, the way of the wicked is, is contrasted with the way 
of the righteous. It's going to be opposite. Whereas the righteous was fruitful. The, the way of the wicked is fruitless. It's not a blessing to others. It is not enduring. The wind blows it away. And it is not prosperous. Now you may think, but what about all the ungodly people that we see that seem to be prosperous? To seem to have it all. Well, they might be prosperous from a worldly standpoint, but they're not blessed. They are not blessed. They are not supremely happy and fulfilled. Now, Brother Tim reminded us of this um, in uh, a message that he gave a couple weeks ago on Philippians chapter 4, in giving like, encouraging us to give like Christ. And he, he gave us a quote from Jim Carrey, uh, a very famous comedian actor, um, and it is astounding. Jim Carrey's quote. He said, I think everyone should get rich and famous and have everything they ever dreamed of so they can see. That's not the answer. Man, that guy's fun. Money, it can't buy happiness. At best, it can buy distraction. How about when that distraction doesn't, isn't enough to distract you anymore? And you have to go deeper. You have to go higher. Something else that gives you a distraction. Well, what, 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 what about when that distraction doesn't distract you anymore? And you feel and you know. That's not the answer. What the future holds for those on the, uh, the, on the way of the wicked. Verse 5 says, Therefore the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. They won't stand in the judgment. Or another way to say it would be, they're going to fall under God's judgment. They won't be found with the righteous. You see... The Lord is king and judge of the earth. The Lord is king and judge of the earth. In fact, Psalm 2 is going to touch on that more. But we see he will judge the ungodly, those who choose to live their life without him in the picture will be judged. So then we see the conclusion of this first psalm in verse 6. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. So as king and judge of the earth, God's word is rule. God's word is law. And that goes, woo, strongly against Humanistic thinking, which is so prevalent in our society. Nah, I'm in charge of my life. I am the master. I make the rules for me. No. The Lord is king and judge. That's why those who live their life according to to his rule, those who delight in the law of the Lord and meditate on it day and night are going to be successful from a godly perspective. We'll be blessed because they're living according to the rules of the king and judge of the earth. The Lord knows the way of the righteous because it's his way of the wicked will perish. So Psalm 1 presents us with simple two choices, two ways. Which will we choose? Jesus presented something very similar in Matthew 7, 13 and 14. He said, enter by the narrow gate, for the gate is wide and the way is easy that leads to destruction and those who enter by it are many. For the gate is narrow and the way is hard that leads to life and those who find it 
are few. Two ways. There's a wide way that leads to destruction and another way that leads to life. If you're walking the way of the ungodly, I pray that you will see the end is destruction. And I pray that our delight will be in God's word and we will live our lives under its direction. Now, if you'll give me just a few minutes to go over here, really important. As John reminded us last week, it's very important as we meditate through the Psalms to see, to recognize how the further revelation of God's word in the New Testament sheds light on what we're meditating upon. In the New Testament, makes it very clear that we are not made righteous by doing works of the law. Now, the message I just gave could sound like, if you weren't, you know, if you didn't have context, it could sound like I'm giving a works-based righteousness message. If I obey God's word, then I become righteous or am saved. That's not. What I'm saying, it's not what God's word teaches. The New Testament makes it very clear we are saved by grace through faith, not works of the law. Consider Romans 3.28. For we hold that one is justified by faith apart from works of the law. Justified means declared righteous. The New Testament also makes it very clear that the Old Testament taught this as well. In uh, Romans chapter 4, verses 2 and 3, Paul said, For if Abraham was justified by works, he had something to boast about, but... Not before God. For what does Scripture say in quoting the Old Testament? Genesis, um, Genesis 15, 6. Abraham believed God. Abraham had faith. And it was counted to him as righteousness. Abraham was justified when he believed God's word. Not because of any works that he did. Lastly, let's consider 2 Corinthians 5.21, what it says about our righteousness. It says, For our sake he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. For our sake he, God the Father, made him, Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ, who knew no sin, perfect, spotless Lamb of God. The atoning sacrifice for our sin and the sin of the world. He made him to be sin. Jesus took our sin. He took all of my sin. He took all of your sin on himself. And in doing so, he took our judgment. He bore the wrath of God the Father, the judgment of God the Father against my sin. He took that on himself. He paid for all my sin, for all your sin. And he gave his, himself for us on the cross. So that in him, we might become the righteousness of God. So that when we place our faith in him, when we say, Jesus, I believe that I am a sinner. That there is nothing I can do to become right, to be made righteous before God. But you died on the cross in my place. You paid for all my sin. You took all my judgment. I believe that you did that for me, and I believe that is the only way I can be made right. When you do that, you are forgiven of all your sin. You are declared right by God the Father because he sees you now in Christ by faith. Having been clothed in that sweatshirt of righteousness, And if you haven't done that yet this morning, I implore you, believe in Jesus Christ today. Be forgiven of your, of your sins. Be made right with God. And for those of us who already have, praise God. Praise God.
God, that we can walk the way of righteousness by faith. Father, thank you so much that we don't have to do anything to become righteous before you. Christ accomplished it all. Lord, as we continue to to walk through this life, we continue to be presented with the two ways of walking like the unrighteous, the ungodly, walking without you in the picture, or walking according to your word. Please, Father, help us to be meditating on your word because we love it and we delight in it. And may your word be the rule of our lives and govern our actions, our decisions, our words, our everything. Thank you so much for giving us your word, for giving us a good foundation. We ask that you would Help us to be blessed people this week because of walking the way of righteousness through faith in Christ and living by your